And now for something completely different and delightful in the levity zone. A visit from the princes of levity themselves, the merry pranksters. For those of you in the know, yours truly, Dr. Bruce, also wears the hat of a historian, not only for his Digibarn Computer Museum collection, but also as an archivist for the library, news archive, and remaining record collection of Dr. Timothy Leary. Since the 90s, I have been amassing stories and collecting the papers and media files of figures of the counterculture, including Dr. Leary and also the late Terence McKenna, who I knew personally. So, alongside the vintage computer artifacts of Steve Wozniak and others, sits the avatars of the history of the 1960s, which, as we know, was at the root of the rise of the personal computer in the 1970s. So, when John Leopold, first district supervisor of the county of Santa Cruz, brought the pranksters to town to celebrate the dedication of an official monument to the 50th anniversary of the first acid test back on November 27th of 1965, your Dr. Bruce and Galen made a beeline to the two live events, recorder in hand. So who are the pranksters? They were and are the band of intrepid trippers who lit the psychic dynamite under the 1960s with their antics and LSD-fueled public happenings, all led by fearless captain of the ship Ken Kesey. At the time, Kesey was one of America's great up-and-coming authors, when one day he flew his cuckoo's nest in order to live the story. It's quite a tale told best in Tom Wolfe's book, the electric Kool-Aid acid test. So join us now with Supervisor Leopold setting the setting and bringing up George Walker in his acid test garb, wielding and whirling Neil Cassidy's famous hammer, followed by mountain girl Carolyn Garcia, Grateful Dead lead Jerry Garcia's first wife, and finally whooping it up with first mate to Kesey, Ken Babs really giving it to us in beat prankster poetic style. And dear listener, peel your ears and you might just catch the first jangle of the birth of that seemingly eternal band, the Grateful Dead. You know, the pranksters involved out of a group of writers and artists, and one who jumped out of the pages of a novel. And that was Neil Cassidy. Uh, he was part of it, the, of the prankster clan. He drove the bus. Uh, he was he's the bridge, in some ways, between the beats and the hippies. And uh, we're lucky here in Santa Cruz that he has family here. Uh, Jamie Cassidy lives in Santa Cruz County. And in the process of putting together tonight's event, uh, George Walker, prankster George Walker, uh, said, hey, there's something that I wanna, that I wanna share with Jamie so they can share what they have for all of us. Come on up over here. All right, George. Oh, over here, George. George, George. George, let, let me just tell you that uh, hurting uh, eight or nine pranksters is a lot harder than working on the board of supervisors. <laughs> Most of the time, they're together, and they're incredibly smart, and, uh, but chaos is their middle name. In, in just a few moments, we're going we're gonna to dedicate some historic markers and the first and only bus shelter, and the Museum of Art and History really made that happen. So, it looks like George is ready. Another mic, Mike, okay. You're all familiar with this, I'm sure. <laughs> Tom Wolfe's electric Kool-Aid acid test. I'm going to read a few words from this before I do. Last night, Roy and I were talking, and Roy said, you know, this is last night's event at the bookstore. This has been like an acid test. And I said, how do you mean? Is that your he said, well, everybody is really open. Everybody's really open to each other, and it's all positive. There's no fear. There's no negativity. Everybody is just open. Everybody's relating to everybody. He said, that's what the acid test was about, is what it was like. And I thought about that for a minute, and I said, you're right, Roy. And you know what? I think we passed the acid test. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, you remember 
what we're really trying to do is free the mind from the consciousness so that we can get to the subconscious where the real shit happens. And uh, the whole point of the acid test was to do that, to get to where we were all free of the limitations of our consciousness so that we could explore each other in a different realm, in a different universe, in a different dimension. But when we finally got done a year of acid tests, we had this event called the acid test graduation. And Kesey said, we're going to try to get there without taking acid. And I said to Roy, I think we did that tonight. I think tonight we graduated. With flying colors. With flying colors. <laughs> okay, the time that we were planning and doing the acid test graduation, which was near the end of 1966, that was the time that Tom Wolfe came around and was checking us out, doing what he did and preparing to write this book. And so I'm going to read a little bit from this book. A bigger glow in the center of the garage. I make out a school bus, glowing orange, green, magenta, lavender, chlorine blue, every fluorescent pastel imaginable in thousands of designs, both large and small, like a cross right. between Fernand Leger and Doctor Strange, roaring together, vibrating off each other, as if somebody had given Hieronymus Bosch 50 buckets of day glow paint in a 1939 International Harvester school bus and told him to go to it. <laughs> On the floor by the bus, is a 15-foot banner reading acid test graduation and two or three of the flag people are working on it. Bob Dylan's voice is raunching and rooming and people are moving around and babies are crying. The nowhere mine. We're going to jerk it out from under the world working in the nowhere mine this day every day. A guy about 40 with a lot of muscles as you can see, because he has no shirt on. <laughs> Just a pair of khakis and some red leather boots on and his hell of a build. <laughs> and he seems to be in a kinetic trance. <laughs> Flipping a small hedge hammer up in the air, over and over, always managing to catch the handle on the way down, with his arms and legs kicking out the whole time, and his shoulders rolling and his head bobbing, all in a jerky beat as if somewhere Joe Cuba is, Joe Cuba is playing bang, bang, although in fact, even Bob Dylan is no longer on, and out of the speakers, wherever it is, comes sort of tape which is spectral voice saying, the nowhere mind. <laughs> Back inside the warehouse, everything keeps up. Slowly and getting more and more of a strange feeling about the whole thing. It is not just the costumes, the tapes, and all that, however. The feeling again when the flag people start coming up to me and saying things like, well, when Cassidy is flipping the sledgehammer with his head down in the mall of the universe, just mauling it all out, and blam! Sledgehammer, and this is it, and it slams into the concrete floor of the garage, and one of the flag people says, you know, the chief says when Cassidy misses it, it's never an accident. <laughs> when Cassidy misses, it's never an accident. He's saying something. There's something going on in the room. Something's getting up tight. There's bad vibrations, and he wants to break it up. <laughs> the next couple months, Neil and Zonker and I took a trip to Mexico to spend the winter in Puerto Vallarta. 
And Neil didn't have a hammer, but he still had all that energy. And so he devised himself another game. We had a little house that was on the beach outside of town. We had about 100 yards of private beach and a caretaker that raked the beach clean every day. Neil needed something to do, so he found himself a couple of sticks. You can imagine this being a stick. He had a stick about like that, and another stick about like that. And he devised, devised this game that he would do with himself. He would pick up the stick off the beach with the other stick, kind of like this. Well, that wasn't very good. He would try to hit it as many times as he could before it got to the ground. And three, four, five was pretty easy, and sometimes he'd get six or seven. I remember one day he came in and was all excited. He says, I got 13 today. <laughs> Imagine hitting that thing up in the air 13 times. It was quite a feat. Well, he did this for several hours almost every day, week after week, out there in the hot sun, flipping this thing around and dancing and doing this, flipping that thing up. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, up, flop. One, two, three, flop. One, two, three, four, five. And he would do that hour after hour after hour. And every day, the beach looked like a herd of cattle had trampled it after it had been so neatly raked. But one day, Zonker and I drove into town for the afternoon, and we came back. And as we walked, were walking up to the door, Cassidy came running out. Don't fight this guy! Don't fight this guy! He said, what, what, what guy? And we looked behind you know, and there's this little Mexican guy, a kind of old guy, from our viewpoint, not as old as we are now. But anyway, he was just kind of sitting there calmly with about a half a bottle of tequila in front of him. And I looked at Kizzy, or Cassidy, and he was kind of thrashed. He was kind of beat up. He had little welts and cuts and shit all over him. I said, what happened? And he said, well, this guy came up to me, and I was you know, doing my thing. And he picked up a stick, and he says to me, On guard! <laughs> well, you know, I give him my best arrow, Flynn. And the guy beats beat the shit out of me. <laughs> the guy was a real sword fighter. And, and Neil had no idea. He thought it was just, you know, he'll play a little movie thing, and I'm tapping little sticks and stuff like that. The guy just thrashed him in about 10 seconds. And so, you know, Neil finally threw down the sword. By the time I got there, they had drank most of a bottle of tequila together, and there was no more any issue. Anyway, that is just a little viewpoint of what Neil was like. And here is that very hammer. Wow. This isn't just not any old hammer. This is the Neil Cassidy hammer, which years later, Kesey and Babs and Simon did the famous dip painting to it. And it's got the little relics of that left. And then after several jobs of fixing the bus, Simon just stuck the hammer in his toolbox and took it home. Simon lives at my place up in Scapoose. And I saw this hammer around, and then it was the hammer. And he does beat a part of about 40 Volvos with it. Simon works on Volvos and beats various parts of the sledgehammer. A few months ago, Jamie Cassidy sent me an email, and she said, George, do you have any idea where the hammer is? I said, yeah, it's here. <laughs> Why, you want it? And she said, yes. I said, okay, next time I come to California, I'm gonna bring it to you. That's now. So yeah. Jamie, yeah. come up here. I'm gonna give you this here hammer. It's yours now. Okay. I've seen since Stan left us. Pretty cool. <laughs> so everybody have a wonderful time. This is a great, great, great event. And uh, thank you, George. Thank you. And you're welcome. For those of you who don't know, these are my original acid test pants. <laughs> which I have not worn. No, you hold your mind. I have not worn these until today since the last session. All right. Thank, thank you all for coming. Well, I can tell you that if there was one person who was going to be topless on stage tonight, I'm glad it wasn't me. <laughs>
And just, uh, by the way, if, uh, if anybody is imbibing any substance, I prefer if you did leave here and said, I dropped with Supervisor John Leopold. That would probably be not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The headline in the Sentinel tomorrow. <laughs> Anyway, we, we, the, the reason, one of the ways in which we made this all happen is we're going to be dedicating a historic marker uh, at the site in SoCal, uh, along uh, SoCal Drive between Dover and North Rodeo Gulch. And we couldn't all be there tonight. There isn't enough room. Uh, the actual uh, house, uh, the spread is no longer uh, around. And so rather than trying to squeeze into that little piece of land on a night that might be raining or something, we decided to hold the event here. Uh, and so what we have tonight is not the actual uh, 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 historic marker and not the actual bus stop because you can't bring those things around easily. But we have replicas or near replicas of what's here. And, and there were a couple people who helped make it happen. The Museum of Art and History, decided this was a great project and they started as a fiscal sponsor for all the different parts uh, of this weekend. Uh, the Santa Cruz Metro, the, the transit agency, but unanimously agreed that we could take this bus stop and reimagine it into something different. Uh, and for a, a transit agency, that's a big deal. Uh, Ledger Point Design helped us design all these pieces, and community printers did a great job in this model that you would hear that's actually made of cardboard, not, not what it'll actually be when, it, when we have it there. George brought up that there was the acid test graduation, and, and everybody was there got diplomas. And I, as a representative of the county of Santa Cruz, have created proclamations for all the members of the Franksters here. So you're now part of Santa Cruz history in a different way. And I won't read the whole thing because uh, I want you to still like me at the end of it. <laughs> but let me just read it just a part of it. Uh, whereas on November 27, 1965, an intrepid group of merry Franksters and friends held the, the first acid test at the spread in Soquel. And whereas the event brought together the beat generation and the emerging hippie generation in a free-form psychedelic happening that celebrated the bohemian spirit of creativity, expression, and improvisation. And whereas the acid test established the form of audience-performer interaction and collective participation that would define the San Francisco rock dance scene and the emerging counterculture, and whereas it is fitting that we mark the half century since the first acid test in SoCal to chart the transition of the counterculture into our culture, now therefore I, John Leopold, Santa Cruz County First District Supervisor, hereby recognize the Merry Pranksters for their contribution to the sustaining impact of the acid tests into our culture and honor their contributions to Santa Cruz County, California, the United States, and the world. Of the, of, the, of the marker that's going to say, can you pass the acid test? And then if everybody will just move away from here, you'll be able to walk into this in just a moment. But ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the very first bus stop dedicated uh, to our friends, the Franksters, the Grateful Dead, the Hip Pocket Bookstore, and Neil Cassidy. Just point out to you that there's a picture uh, of the bus on the front side, on the one side, that when you drive down Soquel Drive, it will say, do it. the counterculture comes Your to bus. Santa Cruz. And the other side is a picture of the bus, and it says, the counterculture comes from Santa Cruz. Yeah. Yeah. So please, during the evening, get a chance to take a look at this uh, bus shelter. But I want to ask uh, our friends, the Franksters, uh, about coming up. I know a couple of them uh, want to speak. Um, I'm going to call on uh, 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 my friend, Carolyn Garcia, you know her as Mountain Girl, to come up and speak first. This is quite an occasion. I, I never expected anything like this from John Leopold. <laughs> However, I, I want to thank the uh, promoter of this and the um, proprietor of this fabulous little venue. 
And uh, I think that he's looks like everybody's here. And thank you all for coming. This is this is what we do. We go to stuff. Don't we? <laughs> so you never know what you're gonna go to when there's pranksters involved. And this is just the same sort of weird little gathering that we used to have. And you're self-selecting, I want to point out. You're just self-selecting for a very counter, 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 counter culture. <laughs> and we're mighty proud of this concept here. The bus that came by and I got on. Because I sure as heck did. I got picked up by Neil Cassidy in 1964 and whisked off and I saw the bus that very day and I fell in love and I met wonderful people and I couldn't ever tear myself away from both those people and that bus. And it's still one of the most magical things that has connected us all together in a really nice fellowship. And it's, it reminds you, you know, stay close to your friends. They are really interesting people, after all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I want to call up uh, Ken Babs. Yeah. Okay. Everybody's been taking pictures of us. So I'm sick of. <laughs> this, this, right, this right here Woo! is the real picture. You guys <laughs> come here to put up with this bullshit. <laughs> we gotta thank John Leopold. I mean. <laughs> an obscure event that took place here 50 years ago. It's built up to something magnificent and huge. And it's really nice over the 50 years. In America, you know, everything important that happened 50 years ago is given a big deal. And then it's forgotten, <laughs> which is only right. But the neat thing about the 50 years is that it is all a myth. And the myth grows, and it'll continue to grow. It'll grow for thousands of years, about the 60s. And as it grows, slowly all the bullshit will slough off the mountain. <laughs> and then the enduring story will be there, something like Homer's Iliad or the Odyssey. And that will be the story. Look forward to it. <laughs> Well, this all came out of nowhere to me. And the way it came was I got an email from some guy I didn't even know who said that his birthday was November 27th, which was the anniversary of the first acid test, and he felt like he was a special person and that he had was living his life according to the prankster principles. <laughs> and he said about all the stuff we did, was it merely a series of chance coincidences, or do you feel it was all preordained? I answered him, yes, true, with lots of free will included. <laughs> now to set the story straight, since I was the host, you would say, of the thing, the, the house and everything. <laughs> uh, I need a more to remember on there, okay. I run a little piece, I'm cutting it down to nothing. I mean, we've been really overwhelmed here. It wasn't really an acid test, per se. We hadn't started doing the acid test yet. And dig this, it was a Halloween party. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. The Mary Band, the Pranksters, you know, was actually a band. And we played our instruments in a bizarre fashion, calling our music a form of nonverbal communication. We set up our instruments in the living room of the house, and we went outside to commune with the moon. We formed an own circle, 
and held hands. The clouds parted and the moon came down. A beam of light came down on all of us and we rose three, four feet off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but this was a special, wonderful moment where we were all in our costumes for the Halloween party. Mountain Girl was Little Bo Peep. <laughs> Lee Kornstrom was Clark Kent, the famous reporter. George Walker, he was Flash Gordon, zooming around so fast you couldn't keep up with him. Mike Hagen was the Eastern Oregon wheat rancher. I was the spirit with my face painted up like him. Gretz was the Wonder Woman. And Keezy was the Wizard of Oz. As we settled down on the ground from our own circle, we heard music coming from the house. And we went inside to find these guys on our instruments and playing. <laughs> Phil Lesh on my bass. Big Ben on Gretsch's piano. Bob Weir on Mike Hagen's guitar and Jerry Garcia on Keezy's guitar. And they were going and we came in, stood around, and kind of sang with them and everything and kind of leaned over their shoulders and played their instruments with them and everything and finally they faded out and we played for a while. And it went like that all night long as we were zooming and grooving through our high. Allen Ginsberg and Neil Cassidy were there. Very late, we lay on the floor and held microphones and rapped long, nonsensical, political, free jazz morphed into deep religiosos when we started talking about meeting on the other side, if we believed in it or not. Neil, Catholic, Neil Cassidy, the Catholic, said, doggone dog, dog man. Easy the Baptist said, I want to fervently believe. Babs the Delaire said, we won't know till we get there. <laughs> George Walker, putting it off, said, how about it, Ginsburg? What's the Buddhist take? Ginsburg didn't hesitate. There was a chicken on the side of the road, he said. He saw another chicken on the other side. And he yelled across, how do I get to the other side? And the chicken said, you are on the other side. That's great. Yeah. Don <laughs> crested the Eastern Ridge, and everybody packed up and went home, leaving not too bad a mess. Only a three-day job to clean it up. <laughs> I finally figured out the November 27th thing, the confusion. On November 27th, after Thanksgiving, remember the barn? Any of you out there on the road? The left? Leon Tabori. Is it still there? No. Gone. There were a lot of great gigs there. And we had a gig at the barn on November 27th. The Merry Pranksters. We all went there and played and converted and everything. And someone put a uh, sign on the Hip Pocket Bookstore. November 27th. Party at Babs's. But it wasn't at Babs's. It was at the barn. So see the confusion factor? Confusion reigns. We love it. This is what counts. This is what makes the whole story. Without the confusion, there'd be nothing. It'd just be ordinary. <laughs> okay, I'm going to lay it on you now. Uh, we fucked around with the humor and all that. You only get one chance like this to do this. You gotta do it. I'm glad I got all your attention back there and all the murmuring stopped. You can hear me good. So here it is. We never touted the use of LSD. Nor did we provide it for anyone. We were never pawns of the CIA. As Kesey said, our mission was nothing less than saving the world. He knew 
There are forces at work wanting to keep us arguing and fighting with one another, to keep us from working on something together. That would allow evildoers to do their dastardly deeds while we were dicking around, fighting with one another, distracted. Keep your mind ahead. Keep a step ahead. Open a door and blast through their hang-ups, their sick highs. Work for the good. That's understood. We're not running for election and we're not seeking protection. Puncture their hot air balloons with barbs of wit. Deflect their opposing force with off-the-wall antics. Leave them confused and disappear into invisibility. Disappear into invisibility. Put on the cloak of invisibility. Who was that masked man, Martha? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. to make history and to enjoy the great sounds of Slugs and Roses as they play the songs we're all so familiar with. Thank you, pranksters, for being part of Santa Cruz history. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you to Santa Cruz County for loving the pranksters. And let's enjoy. never thought we'd see this isn't it like of this. amazing man it like i said this amazing. this will never nothing like this will ever happen again i think and look might, at all other, these other cities will copy it other towns but i mean to have this group of the pranksters together right. all at this time right here at this it in the same place again. This is so and look fun. these are like you know american folk heroes that change the world Oh, hi. hi. How are you? I'm happy to meet you. Thank you. I'm happy to meet you. Yeah. I hope you, I hope you got some of that. Yep. yep. All right. Yep. Got all of it. Yep. And just in case you didn't, I recorded it. Because Fab said some very important stuff. I'm putting it in the podcast. So, dear fellow traveler, as you can hear, Santa Cruz did get on the bus when it came by and helped birth the so-called counterculture. After long decades under the cloak of invisibility, the very county of Santa Cruz passed a motion and proclamation declaring a bus stop and plaque honoring those same long-forgotten pranksters. Personally, I have lived in these Redwood Mountains for 21 years now, but I'm only now understanding their deep American cultural significance. Thanks to Supervisor Leopold, and the pranksters. I would especially like to thank Mountain Girl for her presence and such a nice warm greeting to Galen. I also want to thank my buddy and co-commentator Rob Menzies and Jacob Amon for his usual inspired job on the cover art, which is a photo I took of the Merry Band. Oh, and also thanks to Don Quixote's, our local music hall slash Mexican joint down in Felton, for hosting the evening, and for Slugs and Roses, a local dead cover band who serenaded us for hours. You'll hear a little bit of them coming up next. Check out photos and video of this wonderful night at www.levityzone.org. We are considering starting a live call-in show for The Zone. What do you think about that? Please get in touch with us about your ideas for the next phase of The Levity Zone. Oh, and one last thing, dear listener. Find freely usable, digitized versions of my counterculture archives at the Internet Archive at www.archive.org by searching under the term Psychedelia Collection. <laughs> 